I'm really excited to talk to you all today. And um, this is my first All Things Open, and you know it would have been more fun to be all together, but I'm enjoying experiencing the virtual um, atmosphere as well. So. As Javi said, my name is Lillian and I work on the Frictionless Data Project within the Open Knowledge Foundation. And today I'll be telling you about how open source can help open science. I have a lot of links in these slides. So I have published the slides here, which you can see at this following this bit.ly link. And I have this link a few places in the slide so you can open them up now if you want. I also have it at the end so you can open it up later and um, you, you can play around with the resources that I have linked whenever you want to. Um, I'm going to try and answer questions during the talk, but if I run out of time, then you know, feel free to follow up with me via email or on Twitter, which I've linked both of those here. All right. Um, oh, last thing I want to say is I want to thank the organizers of All Things Open for helping make this conference happen. I know it's really hard to transition to a virtual conference, and from my perspective, it's been very smooth, so I just want to thank you all. All right, let's get going. All right, so I'm going to try and make this somewhat interactive, as interactive as possible for a virtual conference. So anytime that you see an astronaut, this is a cue that I'm going to be asking the audience to participate. And I'm gonna be asking you to do, write some answers in the chat. So I'll be asking you questions, but this is also a time that you can ask me questions as well. So we're gonna start this talk by talking about open science. And I'm going to assume that some of you might not be familiar with the term open science. You know, this is a open source conference and we're in the open data and open government track. So um, my first question for all of you is in the chat, can you give me like a yes or a no if you are familiar with open science? And I'll give you, you know, like 30 seconds or so to type that in the chat. And don't be shy. Okay, we're getting yeses, this is awesome. Okay, basic knowledge, perfect. Perfect, all right. Thank you, that was great first chat experience. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about open science and I like to use this picture to show that um, open science is an umbrella term and it includes aspects from all of these different terms. But today we're going to be specifically focusing on the ones in blue. So open access, open data, and open source. And we'll also be talking about how open science is a cultural change as well. So open access. Open access can be thought of as how science is published or shared. And in general, science results are published in journal articles or manuscripts. And generally speaking, these are published behind a paywall. So the only way you can access it is if you pay to read it. And this can be very costly. And this is what's called closed access. So open access is where anyone can read the article for free or read the research for free. Open data is the concept of you know, publishing your data openly. And in science, there's two main ways that data gets published. The first is, um, in a manuscript along with the research, but sometimes this is not published openly or it's not published at all. The other way that data gets published is in a repository and these are usually domain specific. And then open source, which of course many of you are familiar with. And in science, the main ways that code is created or used is to create data from experiments or to analyze the data from experiments. And we will be talking more about open source and how it can be involved with various aspects of open science. Um, to tell you more about the open science and like the cultural change and give you some more perspective on the current state of science versus like an ideal open science state, I wanna walk you through an example. And this is the coronavirus. So this is a 
you know, very recent example, obviously, that I really think it highlights the impact and importance of open science. So beginning of January, researchers in Shanghai published the genome sequence of the coronavirus, and they published it openly, which means that anyone can access that sequence and do research on it. And this is abnormal. This is not how research is normally dis disseminated. Typically, researchers would have done an experiment, gotten this result, and then they would have written a paper or a manuscript, which would take a few months. Then they would submit that paper to a journal and it would start going, undergoing the review process, which takes a few more months. And that's where researchers, other researchers, review this article and give feedback and propose changes. Then the original researcher gets that feedback and then has a few months to make changes. And then finally, the research gets published. So this can take about a year after the original experiment is done to actually have the research published. And even then it can be published closed or not open access, which means that not everybody can read this research. So instead of going that normal route, instead these researchers decided to openly publish this genetic data. And then this person Eddie Holmes tweeted about this and tweeted out the link. And you can see how many people were interested in this, you know, and very quickly people around the world, researchers around the world started studying this genetic sequence. Another thing that happened in open science around the same time was that journals promised to provide access to coronavirus related research papers for free. So they decided to make these papers open access, at least for a limited period of time. So this means that anyone can read this research. At the same time, many scientific funders said that if you are working on coronavirus research and you are funded by that group, that you have to publish openly. So these changes really changed the culture of how science was done around coronavirus and led to a lot more research being published. That's what's shown here. This is a graph showing you the massive increase in articles that were published that deal with coronavirus research from the beginning of January to the end of April. And in pink, we have these journal articles that undergo peer review. And in green are preprints, which is a different type of article that hasn't undergone peer review yet, but where everything is published openly. And so other researchers can go in and make edits and give feedback in a quick fashion. So this is just a really great example of how open science principles can be used to change the way that we typically do science to make science faster and more collaborative. So hopefully now you have a good understanding of these principles. And I wanna to talk to you now about how open source can help make science open. And open source is really an integral part of the open science process. As I mentioned earlier, the ways that code is typically used in research, in research is to generate data or to analyze data. So you can imagine if researchers open source that code that they're writing, then other groups can also analyze data and this can lead to increased reproducibility. Also, if you're openly publishing this, then you can collaborate and everyone knows we go farther when we go together. Um, I also want to mention industries. I know this conference is a little industry heavy. So I want to mention that industries can also benefit from this open source research code. A lot of the problems that scientists are dealing with their data are similar problems that like industry data scientists are working on. So it makes sense to work together and collaborate. Also, the open source code ethos is very similar to the open science ethos. You know, I like to say science belongs to the people. Same thing with code. I think code belongs to the people. So we are going to be talking specifically about the open source project that I work on and talking about how we are working with biologists to make their science more open. The project I work on is called Frictionless Data for Reproducible Research. And our goals with this project are to remove friction in research data, to move from data to insight faster. And you can see here, I have a picture of my core team members. You can see it's a pretty small group. 
but we're really community focused. And by that, I mean that we rely on our community to help us and to help the, pro to help the project. So we rely on our community to contribute. We rely on them to give us feedback and also to ask us for new features and really move the project forward. So I'm hoping by the end of the talk, you will be inspired to join our community. Okay, so I said frictionless data, but what are some frictions in data? And we have our astronaut back again. So please over in the chat window, can you type what you think of when you think of frictions in data. And I'll give you all about 30 seconds. Um, and if you need some clues, when I think of frictions in data, I think of things like cleaning the data. Yeah, oh yeah, we're getting great answers over here in the chat. Yeah, different formats, can't find the data, inconsistent format. No metadata, perfect. Hard to keep track of versions. These are great answers. And then I have some examples as well. Um, things like, what does this column name mean? How was the analysis done? Who created the data? And checking data quality. So these are all frustrations that make working with data more difficult. And these frustrations were the, um, the background need that we were trying to solve with the frictionless data project. So what is this project? It is a set of specifications for data and metadata interoperability. It's a collection of open source software libraries, a range of best practices for data management, and importantly, it's platform agnostic, meaning that it's very interoperable. And we are specifically focused today on asking how can researchers use frictionless data. But I want to mention that our tools and our code is not domain specific. So you can use this for any domain, you know, and some of our original users are in open government, for instance. Okay, I'm going to explain what frictionless data is by showcasing two use cases. The first is with VicoDemo, which is an oceanography data management group. And I'll be talking about frictionless data packages and pipelines and also frictionless data validation. And I'm gonna be spending a pretty good amount of this talk talking about VicoDemo because this was a long collaboration and um, it's very interesting and we hit on several of the tools. And then I'm going to be spending a shorter amount of time at the end talking about one of our newer collaborations, which is with Dr. Philip Rocasera. And we call this the frictionless data scripter collaboration. And I'll be talking about extending the frictionless specifications. So let's get started with Bico Demo. Demo is the Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office, and it is a data aggregator where scientists that work on oceanography research submit their data to Demo, and then Demo has data managers that clean that data, and then they provide access to the public to be able to access that data. And I am going to pause very quickly because I see that there is a question in the chat and I'm going to answer it before we get too much farther into this. Um, Brian has asked us, is this inspired or compatible with FAIR data? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, FAIR, for those of you that are unfamiliar with that, is an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and... Um, reusable. And it is very big right now in the research world. And um, at the end, Brian, please remind me if I haven't like circled back to say exactly how frictionless works with FAIR, but very briefly, yes. And we will hit on findable, interoperable, and reusable, and kind of accessible. The quick answer is yes. All right, here we go. So, Demo, 
data management for oceanography research. VicoDemo has amazing data, but it is very messy. Um, they collect data about all aspects of the ocean. So for instance, water salinity or the biology of jellyfish. But the data that they get is very messy and typically not standard. And so it, when we wanted to collaborate together, they wanted to figure out how to go from this messy data to clean data that can then be hosted on their landing page. And it was very important for them to make this process reproducible and transparent. So they want researchers to understand how they went from raw data to this nice clean data and make that process repeatable. So we worked together to create a frictionless data processing pipeline. So the Beco Demo data managers needed to know certain things about the data when it's submitted by the researchers. They need to know what is this data? Does this data seem valid? Like, are there any missing values or values that don't make sense? Does the data need to be transformed or clean? And how can this process be transparent? And when researchers are submitting the data, Bicodema wants to be able to immediately give that feedback to the researchers. Because, you know, researchers are busy and when they're submitting that data is the best time to give them that feedback. You know, these researchers are in the, you know, on a boat in, a, in the middle of the Antarctic doing research and we can't really reach out to them and be like, oh, hey, did you remember to record the metadata? So we're trying to get to them while they're submitting the data. Okay, we're gonna go through these bullet points here and talk about how we work together to solve these problems. The first one is, what is this data? And the solution here is to document the metadata. So I've said metadata, I think a few people in the chat said metadata. So I wanna pause here for our astronaut again and ask you all in the chat, are you familiar with metadata? And if so, what are some aspects of this raw data file that it would help you to have metadata? Or what are some things about this data file that you don't understand? So I'll give y'all you know, 30 seconds again in the chat. Okay, great, great answers. We're getting location. We want a clear explanation about what the columns mean. Are there units? Um, what does ND mean? What is the metric being used? These are great questions. And they're the same questions I have. So the metadata is data about the data and it would describe this. Thankfully, we have the metadata for this file so we can get the answer and you can see here temp means temperature and it's in degrees celsius cond which like what was cond it means conductivity and it also has units so it, this metadata contains the um the header name a description of that data column and the units for that column so this is very helpful information and we wanted to make sure that when researchers were submitting their data that we were able to keep track of this metadata or if they ought to, if they actually had metadata submitted we wanted to make sure that we were maintaining the quality of that metadata so we did this with the frictionless data package which is a core specification of frictionless data and it describes data and metadata you can think of it like a box or a package that contains inside of it your data file and the metadata for that data and optionally a schema that further describes the data and most of our examples i'm showing you today use tabular data so csv files um, but i want to mention that a data package can work for any type of file but we really do focus on tabular data so that's what you'll be seeing most of today and here are some links where you can read more about our specifications and also the link to our github where you can see the code to create and use data packages 
the way that I'm going to show you now to create and use data packages is with our browser tool. And this is called the data package creator and you can find it at create.frictionlessdata.io. And this is a non coding browser tool that anybody can use to create and use data packages. So the way this works is you load a raw data file, for instance, this file here, and then the data package creator will automatically infer metadata about this data file. For instance, it infers the header names and it infers the data types. So here, this is a string. And then you can manually go in and add in additional metadata. For instance, you could add a description like lat is probably latitude, but it would be nice to include that and maybe, you know, the degrees or whatever the unit is. And then as this information is added on the right hand side, we have the metadata and the schema written in JSON. And we chose JSON so it could be machine readable and to increase interoperability. So here you can see all of this information is contained. Um, there are some additional metadata fields that you can add like the authors and the license of the data. And those are very important um, additionally for you know, making things more fair. So we were working with Ecodemo to add metadata or capture the metadata that was already present and make sure that it was machine readable and usable. The next question that we had is, is this data valid? And so I'm gonna tell you my favorite data validation horror story, but while I'm doing that, if you have a data validation horror story, I would love for you to include it in the chat. So <clears throat> my favorite story, and some of you have maybe heard this before, is about Excel changing the names of genes to dates. So Excel will do this where there are certain genes like SEPT1, which sounds like September 1st, that Excel will change from a string SEPT1 to a date. And it's, it's just Excel will do it and it won't tell you that it's happening. And this has actually caused research papers to have to be retracted because then the analysis was messed up. And in fact, this happened so many times that just recently, the Human Gene Nomenclature Committee renamed some of these problematic genes because it was easier to rename the genes than it was to fix this common problem in Excel. And we have uh, Brian in the chat was saying that R and Python can also sometimes convert things to dates. So this is not a unique problem. I know we can hate on Excel sometimes, but um, not a unique problem. So what could have helped us solve this problem? Validating our data. And the way that we validate data is by having a schema. And a schema could describe you know, the contents of a data file. For instance, it would say column A, all of the data should be a string. And then you would run through your data in a schema through a validator. And the validator would say, oh no, column A has a date format in it. And then you could go back through and fix that. So that's what we work on with frictionless validate. And here's a little toy example showing you how this works. Um, quickly, you can see this data has some repeated headers. It has a blank, uh, blank row and it seems to have only two values here, but four here and it should have three. So you can use frictionless validate to quickly validate our data. And here I'm showing you a screenshot of our command line tool where you can um, use it on command line, but we also have Python code, which I have linked down here. So when we do frictionless validate, we can see these validation errors. We see that we have a duplicate header and we have a further message that I cut off for this so you can see it, but the, the message describes it in more detail. Um, we have missing cells, we have blank row, and we seem to also have a type error. And so frictionless validate automatically checks some basic checks, but you can add in additional checks as well. 
Okay, so we use this with EcoDemo to validate data as it is submitted. And here's an example of one of the errors that was caught where you can see row 133 is duplicated to row 115. And this is likely an error, you know, probably wouldn't have the same data, but it is possible that research data could have a repeated row on purpose, in which case you can turn off this specific check so that you won't always get it. Um, but in this situation, this was an error and they were able to contact the researchers and they could fix their data you know, before they went back on their ship to do more research. Okay, next question we worked on is, does this data need to be transformed or cleaned? And to do this, we use the frictionless data package pipelines, which are data processing pipelines. It's a Python framework for declarative processing of tabular data. And it automatically includes some standard data processing steps like joins and find and replace. Um, it will produce it will help you document your metadata and produce a schema. So similar to the create browser tool I showed you earlier. And importantly, the pipelines are defined in a pipeline spec YAML file. This file, which is human readable, specifies the processing steps and all of the execution parameters. So it's telling us exactly everything that happened to that data, which leads to more reproducible data analysis. It also generates a single data package as its output. And here's a link where you can check out this code in more detail. So I wanna show you briefly what this processing tool looks like that we collaborated with BeakerDemo to create. This is what the data manager would see. So it has load the data and then several other processing steps like a find and replace, a convert the date processing step and here we're showing you um, what one of these would look like for find and replace, where they're finding the time, and then they have a find pattern and a replace pattern, and then a note. This is fixing inconsistent time formats. Some didn't have seconds. And then this pipeline spec YAML file is being generated, which has all of these details captured in it in a way that is readable by humans and also machines. So this all helps make this process reproducible. Okay, so to summarize this project with BecoDemo, we worked with them to take messy data about the ocean and run it through this frictionless pipeline that generates a pipeline spec YAML file that tells us everything that happened to that data, a clean, um, data file and a clean data package.json, which describes the data. So it has our metadata and the schema. And then all of this can be hosted onto the Beco Demo website so that any researcher can access this data openly, can access the metadata, and can understand what happened to it. Okay, how are y'all doing? That was just a lot of information. Um, I want to take a moment and answer questions if you have questions before I get into my last use case. Um, so please ask questions and I don't think I can see the Q&A chat somehow if that is happening. Um, or maybe I can pop it up here. Um, nope, lost the Q&A chat. Anyway, okay, great. Don't see any Q&As. Okay, perfect. If you have questions for me right now, please put them in the chat. We really can um, you know, wait another 30 seconds or so. And this is my dog that I'm showing you here on the screen, in case you're curious about that. Okay, great. Beth says, interested in the second use case. Might have questions after that. Perfect. All right, I'm going to move on then. And if you have a question, you know, please post it and I will try and pause and come back to it. Or um, the second use case is pretty short, so we should have a pretty good amount of time for questions. 
here at the end too. Okay, second use case. We're going to talk more about scientific manuscripts. So scientific manuscripts can be thought of as career currency for scientists. And what does this mean? It means that as a researcher, there's only a few ways to advance your career. And one of them is by writing a lot of scientific manuscripts and getting your science published frequently. And so everyone writes manuscripts, but they're difficult. So manuscripts have predefined sections like the methods section describing how you did your experiment and the results section. Um, but these sections are difficult to write. They are not standard and um, they often vary from journal to journal. So even within a journal, they're not standard. They're really not machine parsable or machine readable which makes reproducing research difficult. So we were wondering, what if we could automate this process? Okay, so here we have our astronaut again. So I'm gonna ask you, um, what are some issues with this data table that would limit machine reading or automatic data parsing? And this is a real table that is from a article that was published in eLife, which is a scientific journal. And um, here's the link to that journal article if you want to look at it in more detail. But now I want you all to think about what are some problems with this data set that would make it difficult for a machine to understand it? Yeah, so Carlos wrote multiple headers and gives us a number of columns. Um, yep, like mix of different results on the same table. The less than symbol, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this I love this example because like there's a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, first of all, is this a header? Hard to tell. Um, this is, you know, one column, but then we have four columns here and that, you know, the less than symbol, this is actually very common when reporting P values, which is part of a statistical test. Sometimes they are reported as like whole numbers and sometimes they're reported as a range. So less than or greater than, and that's very common with science. Um, there's also like this, appears to be a header, but it also appears to have data that is important that we would need to capture, but it might be metadata. So it's just, it's confusing. But, you know, if we had all of the information in this paper, then we might understand this, um, this data set. Like it could theoretically be understood by humans. All right, so this is one of the things that we're trying to work with on this project, Frictionless Data Descriptor. Manuscript automation. How can you help researchers create tables, for instance, that work better? So Data Descriptor is a tool that works to generate textual entities like figure captions, method sections, data tables, and it also generates study metadata. It assists authors in metadata and data deposition to public repositories. So this is, you know, things that I was just talking about. So it made a lot of sense for us to work together and collaborate. So our project, we are trying to create frictionless specification profiles that can be used with Data Descriptor. And the main goal is to make published research data more reusable and more interoperable. So here's an example of kind of work that we are working on right now. This is a key resource table from eLife. And eLife, again, is a journal that publishes mainly biology research. And they are like pretty progressive as far as the open science movement goes. And so they actually request that their researchers, when they submit 
research that they submit their resources in this table that follows the specification. So it all, you know, it should all have these header rows and it should have, you know, a few additional constraints. So as a test, we decided to create a frictionless specification profile that could work with the key resource table. And that's what I'm showing you here. And uh, this will be familiar to you from when we were looking at the metadata and the schema in the data package.json file from earlier. So here you can see the schema with the field names and um, you know, the type. And then here we have you know, the various different um, types of reagents that could be okay to have. So this is just describing this you know, one part. And um, you can see this is still pretty messy. So we still have a work in progress here. Okay, another example that we are working on is statistics. And I think maybe I accidentally skipped over that one. Uh oh, okay, I think I deleted that slide, but I can tell you about it. So we're also working on creating a frictionless profile to explain statistics and to make statistic results reporting more efficient and more standardized. Um, and we're working with the STATO ontology to do this. And STATO is a statistics ontology that our collaborator, Dr. Rocasera works on. And the idea here is that you would be able to define specifications for reporting the results of statistical tests. And this is important because when research is done, you have to analyze the data, but scientists aren't always trained in doing statistics and statistics is hard. So it can be difficult to you know, know which tests to do and when scientists publish their results, they usually write down, you know, like we performed a t-test or we performed an ANOVA, but that's all of the description that's given. Whereas in reality, you need more information to understand the, the statistical analysis that was done. So the idea is that we are creating a frictionless profile that would help define the various statistical tests. So it would include the name of the test, a description to the test, and also an RDF type link. And you can see we have the RDF here for this other example. And an RDF type will link to an ontology and ontologies are great because they are you know, linked um, entities. And then you can do some really cool like modeling or understanding of the data once you have that information as well. Okay. Sorry, I deleted that example, but hopefully I explained it well enough for you. Okay, so the next steps with this project are that we are going to create more frictionless profiles for data tables. We're working on domain specific tables. So things like um, really a lot of like genetics is what we're working on right now. And then we also wanna integrate these frictionless profiles with the Data Descriptor app for easier, more standard manuscripts. And, you know, kind of a, a really big goal would be to be able to describe a table like this in a machine readable way and in a reproducible way. Um, but another thing that I want to, you know, a question that I want to leave you with that maybe we can talk about in a few minutes is what do you think the balance is between making something machine readable and making something human readable? you know, when scientists are publishing their research, should they publish a data table? Should they prioritize publishing it for machines or should they prioritize publishing it for humans? So I'd love to talk about that as well. Or, you know, is there a happy medium? Okay, so how can you participate? Contribute to Frictionless. We're always looking for new contributors. Um, also, if you are a researcher in any field, please publish your research and your data openly. And I want you to think, how can you make your work more open and more reproducible? And then I wanted to show you um, a few other cool projects that if this has sparked your interest, I encourage you to look at them as well. The Turing Way has a collaborative guide and community for working with reproducible research. 
the Journal of Open Source Software is a journal of open source software. And this is a way that researchers can publish the software code that they are writing and get like some career currency credit for it. And they're usually looking for reviewers. So if you work in open source and you want to help review some of this new scientific open source code, I encourage you to look at this journal. And then Outbreak Science Rapid Pre-Review is a crowdsourced preprint review server where if you want to read some of this like brand new COVID-19 research and give your feedback to the authors to improve their paper, this is where you should do it. So I encourage everyone to participate. And then if you want to try this yourself, um, here are the two links that I encourage you to check out. This is our new, like brand new Python code. And so um, a good place to start is our documentation. And then we also have a guide on our website, which is still being in the process of being updated to represent our new code. So start at the docs first, but the guide also has some good bits. And I want to thank you and um, take some questions. We have a few minutes left. And, you know, again, lots of links. There's a link to my slides. Um, if you are interested in joining our community, the Discord chat is where we have our community chat. And so please come and join our community. Um, we actually have a community call on Thursday, so this week, at noon US Eastern, 5 p.m. UK. And it's just a like casual Zoom chat where you can come hear about updates and meet other people. Also, we are hiring a community manager right now. So if you're interested in that or know somebody that would be a good community manager um, for a somewhat technical role, check that out. And I will answer questions for the next few minutes, please. Okay, Beth has a question. I'm gonna get us the water first. Okay, thanks for your question, Beth. I'm gonna read it out loud. Do you have any recommendations about online platforms to publish your data to make it widely accessible for the long term? For example, if you're publishing a paper and want your data or code to be easily accessible to other researchers. Yes, um, I personally like Zenodo, which is a, here I can type it in here. Let me make sure I'm typing it to everybody. Zenodo is run by CERN and they're a great repository. Um, Dryad is another good repository. And then there's a lot of um, domain specific re repositories. So, you know, like Vico Demo. Yes. So I would encourage using an online repository. You can also use like GitHub if you don't have really large data. Does that help Beth? Cool. Are there other questions? Uh, let's see, Masoor wanted, can you share these URLs? Yes. So Masoor, the best way, place to find it would be to go to the bit.ly link. Oh, great. Okay, Maura. Additionally, if you're working within higher ed, your institution may have an institutional repository to support data publishing. Absolutely, that is a great place to turn to. If you are at an organization that has a librarian or research librarians, they're going to be your best friend. So ask them, they will definitely have suggestions. Do we have other questions? I think we have about a minute left. Did I miss any questions? Go back and try and read the chat. Okay, if you have questions and, or if you think of questions later, you know, feel free to email me or you can find me on Twitter and ping me and I'd be happy to continue having a discussion with you.